Today we're going to be looking at 1st and 2nd Peter, and so if you would turn in your Bibles to 1st Peter, and we'll look at some of the background information here before we jump in, and uh, make sure you have your notes printed off, and turn to that section as well. All right, so looking at the background context of 1st and 2nd Peter, we see that the author is Peter the Apostle. So don't be confused by the many names that are in the New Testament for Peter. We've already seen that Paul refers to him as Cephas in the book of Galatians. And then uh, remember the Jerusalem Council, Acts 15, James calls him a Simon. Uh, we see that also in the Gospels as well. So Peter has multiple names in the New Testament. It can be easy to get that confused. Uh, the audience. Well, first Peter... Peter is writing to a group of believers that are dispersed throughout Asia Minor. And uh, Peter writes to all the provinces that are in Asia Minor. So I have a map here, and I think it's also in your notes as well, uh, that we'll look at here in just a second. Second Peter is written to a general audience of believers. However, in 2 Peter 3, Peter says, as I previously wrote to you. So assuming that 1 Peter is the letter he's referring to and not some letter that we don't have, it's highly likely that both 1 and 2 Peter are written to the exact same group of people in what we would call Asia Minor here. So let me go to the map and then we can come back to the notes if you'd like to finish writing that. So you'll notice here we've got Asia, Bithynia, Galatia, Cappadocia, Pontus, and of course, if we're looking at our Bibles here at 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Right? So clearly there is some uh, spread here of believers to this area, and they're viewed as exiles. And maybe Peter is just using terminology that's talking about them kind of being spiritual exiles, in other words, way away from uh, uh, you know, the, the average uh, religious beliefs that are going on in Asia Minor. It could also be, though, that they are real exiles, that maybe they were pushed out by the Roman government. Potentially, maybe there's some background material here that as Claudius, the emperor, ha removes Jews from the city of Rome, that maybe Peter is writing to those who have been dispersed from that expulsion and they ended up moving to Asia Minor and uh, taking up residence there. So that's a possibility, but it's a reconstruction, right? We're not sure about that. When did Peter write? Well, both of these are going to be very close in date, 63-ish, 65 maybe, right? Question marks here. Uh, it's believed that Peter was martyred under the reign of Emperor Nero, maybe around 65, 66, 67 AD. So one of our key dates that we've been working with in the course is that in 70 AD, the Romans invaded Jerusalem and they, of course, overthrew the city of Jerusalem. Uh, so Peter is ma martyred before that time. And so presumably he wrote the letters uh, very soon prior to that, right? There are some issues of authorship when it comes particularly to 2 Peter. Uh, Karen Jobes, a noted Petrine scholar, says this, the intertwined issues of author, date, and genre are probably more complicated for 2 Peter than for any other book of the New Testament. Unless new evidence comes to light, it is doubtful that we'll resolve these questions with certainty. And some of these questions have to do with the, the Greek of First Peter that's different from the Greek of Second Peter. Um, but personally, I think that we, th this can be answered and understood by, by recognizing that Peter may have actually been the person who wrote one of the letters, but he may have used a scribe or an amanuensis to write the other one. And so this is uh, how we can explain some of these differences. But they're more than just the Greek, right? There's some um, there's some issues as far as genre and that, but I personally think that Peter is the author for both of them, and I think that he is referencing his first letter um, in 2 Peter. Well, the purpose statement. 1 Peter is written to encourage believers in the midst of suffering, persecution and suffering. And 2 Peter is 
Peter warns of false teachers and their teachings. So a significant section of 1 Peter is going to be uh, Peter saying, look, when you are in a situation, particularly a social situation like master-slave or a government that is oppressive or even husband and wife relationships where maybe uh, where there's some unhealthiness there, Peter is telling each of these individuals, look, when you don't have many options to get out from under persecution, how are you supposed to be thinking about that? How are you supposed to be processing the suffering here? So 1 Peter in particular is uh, giving us a lot of guidance. And of course, as you can imagine, the model sufferer here is going to be Jesus, right? Jesus is going to be the one who exemplifies how to suffer righteously and you and I are supposed to follow in the pattern of what Jesus did. So we'll be looking for that as we move into the letter, letters here. Okay, so we add the Petrine letters to our mailbox, Believers in Asia Minor, both of them together. And let's look at some of the literary features here of these two books. All right, out of all the authors of the New Testament books, we actually know the most about Peter. So we get to see him in the Gospels, we get to see him in the Acts, uh, the book of Acts, I should say, and then we get to see him with these two letters here. So we know the most about Peter, and we get to see his growth in his recognition and declaration of Jesus as the Messiah. So as you're kind of writing down this note, just go back in your, your memory banks here and think about Peter and the Gospels. There's particularly this one scene, which is very dramatic. Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, right? The son of the living God. And Peter says, excuse me, Jesus says to Peter, you know, nobody told, revealed this to you. Flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you. This is something that my father in heaven has given you. And so it's, it's really a pat on the back. Well done, Peter. You answered correctly. And then almost immediately, Peter gets upset with Jesus because Jesus says, look, I'm going to be going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be persecuted and I'm going to suffer at the hands of the Jerusalem leaders. And Peter takes him aside and said, no, this is not the way that a king is going to rise up in Jerusalem. You're, you're not going to be put to death. And of course, Jesus turns and rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan, right? You, you're basically your understanding of the role and function of the Messiah is in error here. So this is what I'm referring to when we talk about uh, Jesus' declaration of Jesus as the Messiah, and then almost his immediate misunderstanding of this, the need for the suffering of the Messiah. And then, of course, his very significant failure at Jesus' trial where he denies Christ three times. Remember that story culminates when eventually a slave girl is kind of calling Peter out publicly and saying, surely you know Jesus, right? And like, I don't even... You know, I, I've got nothing to do with them. So even the one of the lowest members of society, Peter feels obligated to separate himself from Jesus before that individual as well. And then on to his prominent role of leadership in the early church. So we see these low spots of Peter, right? Where we're very sympathetic with him in a lot of ways because we can identify with his failure. And then, of course, in Acts 2, here he is boldly preaching before uh, this Jewish crowd of several thousand people uh, because of the coming of the Holy Spirit and the signs and wonders that are there. And we see him take on a position of prominence in the early church. And then here we have him writing these two letters, right? It's pretty amazing. So we know quite a bit about the life of Peter, at least since meeting Jesus. And we get to see his failures and his successes. And that makes it even all the more interesting when we read about First Peter in First Peter, Peter's argument that when you suffer, you should do it like Jesus did, right? So here we have this complete lack of recognition of the need for suffering from the Messiah in the Gospels. Of course, Peter comes online eventually. But then in 1 Peter, we have Peter saying, look, Jesus suffered, look to him as you are going to be undergoing your own suffering. Big letter B here. And it is a big letter, right? Sorry for how much that is. Peter, 1 Peter significantly uses Isaiah's fourth servant song. So remember, Isaiah's got these four servant songs. The fourth one is the suffering of the servant, Isaiah 53. And he uses this to describe 
Jesus' suffering on the cross and to exhort believers to follow the pattern of Jesus. And so just explicitly in your notes, I'm just connecting the, what I just said to the notes now. Peter's teaching and admonition show how far he has grown since his initial rebuke of Jesus when Jesus informed him of the need for the Messiah to be put to death. So Peter has really come around here, and it's pretty amazing if we wanted to do some kind of a charting of the character development of Peter in the New Testament, right? We get to see uh, the growth that he has has undergone uh, in that process. Big letter C here. Whoops. Second Peter and Jude both have a lot in common. So Second Peter uh, and Jude are both talking about false teachers. And if we were to read them side by side, you would notice that a lot of the same illustrations that they use uh, are, are identical. And so they both discuss false teachers based on shared illustrations and warnings, which leads scholars to conclude that either Peter used Jude to write 2 Peter, or that Jude used 2 Peter to write his short letter, or that both were kind of drawing from maybe a, an, an early church uh, set of beliefs. In other words, maybe there was kind of some stock illustrations of rebellion and false teachers, and so both of them are independently drawing upon some well-known illustrations. Uh, the current scholarly consensus you can see there is that uh, Peter used Jude's work. So maybe Jude was written first and then Peter used that um, in order to write his letter warning believers about false teachers. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this, but if you were to read them side by side, then you would clearly see they both talk about fallen angels in Genesis 6. They both talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, they both uh, talk ab about uh, um, this, uh, the, basically the idea of rebellion and forsaking uh, the responsibilities and position that God has given people uh, and, and, base and, and rejection of God's authority there. All right, big letter D. Peter also significantly references Paul's letters which is one of our most significant clues to the fact that there was early on some kind of collection of Paul's letters that was maybe in the early days of being established. And we don't really know how Paul's letter collection came together uh, or the order that it has. You know, we don't have any editor that's telling us why they were arranged the way they did. It's, I think it's possible that Paul himself was the one who began organizing his letter collection, Romans and then 1st and 2nd Corinthians and in the early days. Uh, but here we have Peter talking about Paul's letters, and there's some pretty significant things that he says here. So I'm going to go ahead and read this passage, 2nd Peter 3, 3.15, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. So here Peter is acknowledging, I'm reading Paul's letters, and yeah, there's some things here that are, that are you have to chew on it. They're difficult. And then he goes on to say, they're hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Isn't that fantastic? He's actually equating... Paul's letters with the other scriptures that they have, presumably the Old Testament would be a very obvious um, category that Peter would have that is scripture. So we have one of our most significant uh, set of verses here that's pointing to how the scriptures were formed and of course how even the early church leaders were interacting with one another. They weren't all on their own separate mission here, Peter is saying, look, I'm reading Paul's letters and I'm benefiting from them. And yeah, there's some things that are tough in there, but this is the scriptures. So keep reading them, keep studying them. All right, let's move on to some theological emphases in Peter's letters. And once again, we're not going to be able to go into depth here uh, of what Peter's talking about uh, or all the many themes that he brings up. So I've just kind of selected a few here to bring out. Key among them is 
the model of Jesus as sufferer. So big letter A, Jesus' suffering on the cross is read through the lens of Isaiah 53 and the suffering servant, and Peter uses that to provide direction and to exhort the audience who are being persecuted. So in other words, Peter knows Isaiah 53. He knows it depicts the suffering servant, and he's recognizing that Jesus is that prophesied, predicted suffering servant. And so he is reading the events of Jesus' suffering using the language of Isaiah 53. And the outcome of that is, hey, here's the direction and exhortation that you should have when you're, being, when you're undergoing suffering. So let's look at this text together. So I'm going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Now, I really think that the context begins up there in verse 13. So if we had more time, we could unpack that. But look at verse 18. And I want you to see if you can spot some of the Isianic language, some of the language from Isaiah 53. And I, I have a chart in your notes so you can kind of follow along that way as well. Verse 18, servants be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and you suffer for it, you endure this, you endure, this is a gracious thing on the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in turn. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is a chart that helps us to kind of see some of the similar language that Peter is using. Now, there is one extra it's kind of like bonus round uh, bit of information about Peter's use of the Old Testament. And we talked about this maybe like the fourth or fifth day of class about how in the, 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 the literature that was being produced in between the Old and the New Testament, Jewish people were writing about their expectations of the Messiah. Jewish people were writing about how to live in exile. And significantly, the Old Testament began to be translated from Hebrew into Greek. And so as people were not living in Israel, they didn't speak Hebrew outside of Israel, uh, that would be the exception, not the rule, but everybody spoke Greek. So as the Old Testament was translated into Greek, we call this the Septuagint. Uh, that's a bit misnamed, but that's what it is. The Old Greek or the LXX, the Septuagint. And I, I want you to notice that there are some places where, of course, the Greek and the Hebrew line up very well, the same wording. But then there's some other places where the Greek translation has a bit of a, a different flavor, a different nuance, and Peter actually demonstrates that he's using this translation in his presentation. So much like we have all kinds of different English translations to draw from, and they may have some different wording here and there, it's interesting to note that Peter is here using a Greek translation. So for example, we can see some similarities. Look at verse 7. Uh, on the ESV, so this would be an tr English translation based on the Hebrew text. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. And then if we look at the Greek translation, of course, this is in English as well. And he, because he has been ill-treated, does not open his mouth. Very similar wording, not much difference there. And then Peter, when he was reviled, he did not revile in turn, right? A little bit different wording. That's probably because Peter's not quoting Isaiah 53. He's using the language of Isaiah 53 to retell the story of Jesus. So we're not looking at a quotation, but what we would call an allusion. But let's look at one that is a bit more significant in the difference. If we look at verse 4 here, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So this is an English translation of the Hebrew. But then when we look at the English translation of the Greek, 
This one bears our sins and suffers pain for us. So here we're seeing a difference between the Hebrew text and the Greek translation of that Hebrew. And so that's a question. Well, why did they translate it the way they did? That's a bigger question than we can deal with today. But notice Peter, verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body. He's clearly referring to the Greek Old Testament here. So uh, if you have questions on this and you want to talk about this, um, I really enjoy the Septuagint study, so we can talk about this in more detail. But the only observation I want to make here is that Peter seems to be drawing from a Greek translation of the Old Testament as he's writing to believers in Asia Minor who are all going to speak Greek, right? So this is a, kind of a, a fundamental observation of Peter's use of the Old Testament. And then there's some places like down here where the Greek and the Hebrew line up very closely, and yet Peter is adjusting the wording here because he's making application to his audience. For you were straying like sheep. Instead of notice all we like sheep, all we like sheep, Peter really drives home the point by putting the pronoun you in there. You were straying like sheep, but you've now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Most significant point here, Peter reading or describing Jesus's life through the wording and lens of Isaiah 53. And he's doing that to get to an exhortation that we'll talk about here in just a second. A sub point here that's just a, a technical note, but still pretty significant. Peter uses the Greek translation in order to make some of his points, right? Number two here, believers are to follow in the footsteps in regard to the suffering, excuse me, of Jesus in, in regard to suffering. And Peter gives us two things that he wants to leave us with as far as an exhortation. So if you look at 1 Peter 2.23, I've already read this first one. When Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Now, let's also go to chapter 4 here for the second one. Very similar wording here, chapter 4, verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So notice the two, the, the two kind of uh, characterizations of God here. He is a judge. In fact, we have him described here as a just judge. And then in chapter four, he's a faithful creator. And so definitely this is the admonition or the exhortation that Peter wants to leave us with that when we find ourselves in situations where particularly we are being unjustly or unrighteously persecuted, Notice how Peter makes that dis dis distinction. If you're a slave and you get punished for doing something wrong, he goes, well, that's nothing to brag about. But if you're doing the right thing, if you're righteous in your behavior and you're getting persecuted, Peter says, here's how you're supposed to think about that. Just like Jesus did, he entrusted his situation to a just judge. In other words, there will be someone out there who will hold the guilty accountable and who will defend those who are the righteous sufferer. So entrust yourself to that just judgment of God, even though we recognize that it's not going to be immediate. It's going to be future. And then secondly, Peter says, when you are facing persecution, even though you're living correctly and righteously, you're doing the right things, entrust, again, that same word, you're, we're entrusting, we're letting, we're, we're letting God take care of this, but he says, entrust yourself to a faithful creator. There are so many things that happen in our life that are just outside of our control. And Peter is telling us that, look, when you're suffering in the midst of that, and it really is unjust and unfair, and there's really nothing you can do about it, Peter says, this is what you do. You entrust that to the just judge, to the faithful creator. So here's some subpoints that I think are from elsewhere in Peter's letter also. Peter tells us that we are to live recognizing that we have a future hope and inheritance in the world to come. While you're writing that down, I'll just read verses 
3 through 5. So Peter really starts off his letter this way. Chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So uh, the last days here. So Peter says, even in the midst of persecution and suffering, our hope is going to be on something that is yet future. And then Peter follows this up with a, uh, a very real value in the present time by saying that not only are we looking forward, hopefully, right? But now, verse 6, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials so that the testedness of your faith, or your translation may say the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Peter tells us that a very practical outworking in the present as we are undergoing unrighteous suffering or suffering because of doing uh, righteousness, I should say, unfair persecution, is that our faith is tested and it's purified and it matures, I think is what he's talking about. And so we see this in other letters as well, other, other books of the New Testament. Big letter B, Peter and I'm kind of changing topics here from suffering, but Peter describes the people of God in terms that are reminiscent and identical, really, to national Israel. If we look in chapter 2, verse 9, some of this language will pop off the page. I just, uh, uh, excuse me, when we talk about Exodus 19, uh, you'll remember that God gives kind of the direction and the mission statement for Israel. They are a treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, and then they are supposed to be a holy nation. Notice what Peter says in chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness to his marvelous light. So we see here that Peter is taking language that described Israel's mission statement, and he's saying, look, we can say that exactly about the church as well, although recognizing that we are not a nation, right? We're an international group. Big letter C here. Peter warns against false teachers. So now we're moving once again to a new topic, Second Peter. These false teachers, there are many illustrations that characterize them or that helps us to understand what the problem with the false teachers are. But, and we can summarize them as they're rebellious to authority, they're sensual, and they're deniers of the future judgment. In other words, they're sinning and they're saying, it's going to be all right. There's not going to be any future judgment based on this. So I'll just read a couple of verses here. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive her heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So if you're interested in knowing more about the, the illustrations that Peter provides, you can look at verse 4. It says he didn't spare angels when they sin. Um, you can look at verse 5. He didn't spare the ancient world. Uh, when they uh, were full of violence, he sent the flood. Uh, we also have Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 6. And of course, if we were to look into the book of Jude, we would see the exact same illustrations being used there. So... Big letter D, Peter connects the current righteous living that we are supposed to be doing, right? Living righteously in the present with our knowledge of God's judgment 
and the future full rule of King Jesus. In other words, we've talked a little bit over the semester about a positive motivation for living a holy life, saved, and I don't believe that God will ever strip away that salvation because He has made a commitment to us. We believe the gospel, we are placed in Christ, we can't get out. And yet we see that throughout the pages of the New Testament, there are many motivations that that God gives us for living righteously in the present. And so here, Peter is contributing to that. Look at chapter 3 here of 2 Peter, verse 11, towards the end of his letter, right? Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, in other words, he's talking about the present creation and its renewal. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So once again, Peter is dangling out the fact that, look, the the present uh, creation of God is is going to undergo some judgment, and there's going to be some shifting here. And yet you and I live righteously and holy because we know that there will be a new creation under the rule of King Jesus here. And we could continue on and read about that as well.